Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. If you enjoy this video, please do your part and become a member of the channel or drop me a super thanks. And if you can't do either of those, then please just like and subscribe. It's really appreciated. Now, this is another in my Quest for Power series. If you've been following along, we've already dug into things like supercharging, turbo supercharging, and even water methanol injection. If you've missed, go catch up on the whole playlist. But today we're going to talk about a system that didn't get much glory during the war, but became the savior of the big piston engine afterward. That's right, we're talking about turbo compounding a system designed to recover power that was otherwise just going out the exhaust stack and into the sky. Waste not, want not, especially when you're trying to push 60,000 pounds of aircraft across an ocean. Let's rewind for a second. What is turbo compounding? Don't get it mixed up with turbo supercharging. A turbo supercharger takes exhaust gases and uses them to compress the intake air, letting you cram more oxygen into the cylinders. And more air means more power. Great! But here's the catch. Even after that turbo has done its work, there's still a ton of energy left in the exhaust. It's hot, it's moving fast, and it's being completely wasted. Enter the blowdown turbine, or power recovery turbine, or PRT. Essentially a second turbine placed downstream of the turbocharger. But instead of using it to compress air, we hook it up to the crankshaft and use it to turn the propeller. Yep, we're literally mining the exhaust for horsepower. This is the key difference. Turbo compounding doesn't just help the engine make more power, it actively adds horsepower back to the crankshaft. It's like the engine is burning its fuel, making its usual power, and then reaching into the trash to find extra energy, sometimes hundreds of horsepower, to help turn the prop. Pretty clever, but pretty temperamental. And that explains the answer to the big question. If turbo compounding could give you hundreds of free horsepower, why didn't we just stick it on the Spitfires and Thunderbolts and Super Fortresses? Sadly, during World War II, nobody really got this working in combat aircraft. The technology existed, kind of, but there just wasn't time to make it work reliably on fighters or bombers. There was a lot that had to be worked out to make a system that routed white-hot flaming exhaust through multiple turbines and then tried to gear that back into a high RPM crankshaft. Firstly was complexity. These systems added weight, heat, and mechanical intricacy. For example, even to connect the low-torque, high-speed turbine rotation to low-speed, high-torque output to drive the propeller without lurching, required a fluid coupling. This is a system to transfer power without connecting the drive mechanically. Imagine a housing or a shell filled with oil. There's a power impeller on one side and an output impeller on the other. The PRTs spin the power impeller, which spins the oil, which spins the output impeller. At least, that was the theory. Also, World War II fighters needed reliability, simplicity, and fast service and maintenance turnaround time between missions. Not three more tricky turbines to worry about. The second main problem was cooling issues. The PRTs ran really, really hot. We're talking molten metal levels of exhaust gas. Mechanics nicknamed them parts recovery turbines since the increased exhaust heat meant that sometimes the engines overheated and destroyed themselves. Managing the heat required some clever engineering that just wasn't mature during the war. And as as much as I hate to admit it, the jets were coming. By the time turbo compounding was viable, the writing was on the wall. Jets were faster, simpler in some ways, and the military wasn't about to invest in perfecting an old technology when the new one was already breaking speed records. And yes, we will have more of Tanner's Just Jet series, where my active duty fighter pilot collaborator talks about what turns her turbine, jets. 
But after the war, when airlines were still running big radial-engined airliners like the Lockheed Super Constellation and Douglas DC-7, turbo compounding got its chance. The engine that really put this into practice was the Wright R3350 Duplex Cyclone. The same basic family that powered the B-29 Superfortress, but heavily evolved. In its turbo compounded form, it had three power recovery turbines that added up to 500 horsepower back to the crankshaft, boosting total output to around 3,500 horsepower. That's a 15% gain in power from just recovering energy that used to be wasted. Yes, in the short term, turbo compounding helped piston airliners stay competitive during the late 1940s and early 1950s, bridging that awkward gap before jetliners like the de Havilland Comet and Boeing 707 arrived. But once jets took over, the complex and maintenance-hungry turbo compound engines faded fast. Their day in the sun was brief, but a perfect example of engineers trying to wring every last ounce of efficiency out of a technology that had already given so much. So I think we have hit the end of the line in this series, which was to be about piston engines. If you want to learn about World War II rocket propulsion, check out my ME163 Comet vid. How about pulse jets? Well, check out my Fiesler FI-103R Reichenberg and the ME328 videos. I think they're pretty fascinating. But in the meantime, keep your mixture rich, your props spinning, and your exhaust doing something useful. If you enjoyed this video, please consider dropping me a super thanks or join my crew and become a member of the channel. There are advantages to becoming a member with exclusive content, badges, and warbird emojis. If you can't do either of those, then please just share, like, and subscribe. It's really appreciated. Until next time.